<laughs> right. So obviously, as you know, the topic of discussion today is uh, my talk about the partition of India took place on the 14th and 15th of August, 1947. This is not from any perspective, I have to say, but um, I, 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 this is my own understanding and knowledge of it from what I was taught at school in my history lessons. So that's, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> um, the partition of India, obviously, as we know, it was a very major event and it still casts a long shadow of the whole of the uh, South Asian subcontinent. Right. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so we must look at this map very carefully because this is the map of British India before partition, right? And then we move on to the next map, which is India after partition. Now, the area that is shaded a dark chocolate, as you can see, Pakistan and East Pakistan. So you can see that Pakistan, when it was split, was in two far-flung corners of India the western part of India and the eastern part of India. Obviously, this map does not look like this at the moment now because East Pakistan then became Bangladesh. So we are going to look at the story of how all this happened. Um, the next slide is of uh, Mr. Nehru, Pandit Nehru on the left, and then Muhammad Ali Jinnah on the right. Uh, both of them belong to the educated elite of India. They were both lawyers and both very um, astute uh, diplomatic gentlemen in their own right. But of course, uh, Pandit Nehru was a staunch Hindu and Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a, a staunch Muslim. And um, they, along with Mahatma Gandhi, were the main players in negotiating this uh, whole transition. Uh, when this whole thing came about, um, there were two parties that were formed, which I'll talk about later, but I just want you to see this uh, particular slide. These are members of the All India Muslim League. They were the party which was found, you know, part of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Uh, and as you can see uh, in this photograph, these are very uh, suited, booted gentlemen. Um, you know, and they, they, were, they were demonstrating all the way in London in August 1946, because they were very worried that Muslims as a religious minority would be ignored in unified independent India. So this, this really lay the whole foundation, but how did this whole thing come about? You know, this is what we, we need to look at uh, next because in, in August, 1947, the Indian subcontinent was divided into two nations, the majority Hindu India and the majority Muslim Pakistan. This was a very hastily planned transition by the British. And this led to one of the largest refugee crises in history as we know it. Before partition, Hindus accounted for nearly 70% of British India's population and the Muslims made up a quarter. But what is important to note, and, and, there, and this is where we go back to the map I showed you earlier, that um, you know, these religious groups were actually dispersed all over India but they were concentrated mainly in the, you know, the east, the Punjab region, and then on the other side in the Bengal region. And these two regions are you know, far away from one another. So what happened was that the provinces of Punjab and Bengal actually became the two most afflicted um, states during the partition because Punjab had a near equal Hindu and Muslim population and so did Bengal. So, these two states actually formed, uh, you know, very big part of uh, the whole, you know, scenario as it as it unfolded. Historically, interestingly, the um, partitions roots, the roots of partition, actually date back to the 17th century, when the British India, uh, when the British East India Company arrived in 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 India. This was a private British company, like you have Twitter and you know, I mean, you know, any company like Twitter or Facebook or whatever, they, they arrived in India with the view of trading in, in spices, silk, cotton, things like that. But they soon realized that India was a very divided country. It was made up of many princely states and there was a lot of money to make. You know, they were, their main focus was on making money. There was a lot of money to make. 
and and that's what they did you know and and in making that money what they realized was that they could actually exploit the whole situation the fact that there was a lot of princely slate states there were muslim princely states hindu princely states and they started pitting them against one another just to gain that control they started taking over the land you know trying to run the local governments um you know making laws that um defied whatever was going on locally and and slowly in doing this they became a very powerful business i mean their their acquisition of indian cottons and silks they sold them as far as mexico and hong kong their spices were sold all over in all of the world nowadays when you buy black pepper from the supermarket you never think about it as being such a precious thing but at that time spices were very they were a very lucrative business so in short the mercenaries became the oppressors this was one of the reasons interestingly why napoleon later on called british the the britain uh, the nation of shopkeepers this was this was the reference he was making but but the arrival of the east india company made a lot of pro created a lot of problems they had a small armies to fight all the local princely states to gain control over them things like that and i'm going to take you fast forward uh into another 150 years and we we, we reach the mutiny of 9 of 1857 which happened in india which was exactly this the 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 you know the racial the religious tensions that were created between the hindus and the muslims uh reached a point where there was a lot of tension disbelief mistrust there was a rumor spread that you know the bullets that the um uh hindu sepoys were the hindu soldiers were using were greased with uh beef the ones that the muslims were used were greased with pork and 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 i'm just putting it simplistically because talking about the mutiny of 1857 is another topic i can come back with because one of my favorite <laughs> incidents in history but basically it led to the point where there's a lot of anarchy and confusion and and this whole scenario came to the attention of the british government they had to intervene and in 1857 they actually in 1858 they actually dissolved the east india company so they nationalized this they they took over the east india company and they appointed officials <clears throat> and these officials that were appointed by the british government uh, they, they, some of them, or many of them, they had never so, set foot in India before, and they were going to manage a colony, uh, which they knew nothing about. But it was a good economic investment, so why not? India had, um, you know, vast natural resources which could be tapped into, so why not? So, there we move on to the next um, next stage, right? So the next stage is that again the British government realized the same thing that the East India Company had realized that India was a huge country, lots of princely states, and to preserve its dominance, they had to, uh, they decided to emphasize the differences. They decided to exploit the differences. And uh, they also, because they were, they were diplomatic about this, they gave Indians a limited political role, just to keep them quiet. But this process often pitted the Hindus and the Muslims against one another. It was a deliberate, it was a deliberate thing. Uh, we finally move forward and we reach 1905. In 1905, uh, Lord Curzon was appointed the first British Viceroy of India. And his arrival into India um, was welcomed, but at the same time, he, he decided that he's going to split India's largest province, which was Bengal. He was going to split it into two, one majority Muslim and the other majority Hindu. And this actually is what later sowed the seeds for the partition of India. This was the beginning of the divide and rule policy of India officially, because before that it was done um, under guise, you know, but Lord Curzon's deliberate decision actually highlighted this more and um, the local population became more and more aware of it. So there we, you know, that's what that's what happened. The, the split of Bengal was a very major event in this whole drama because it actually triggered the independence movement in India. The Indian National Congress, which I mentioned before, <laughs> was formed with a majority Hindu 
um, the numbers. And it also spurred the formation of the Muslim League, which was a political party that began to agitate for Muslim rights within India. And Muhammad Ali Jinnah was uh, the leader of this party. But interestingly, at that very point came the onset of the Second World War. And Britain took India into the Second World, World War with them. The Indians, many Indians opposed to this involvement in the war and to shore up support, what the British did was to keep them quiet again to quell the tensions. The British government offered India status as a British owned dominion that could govern itself under British supervision. Unfortunately, the Indian National Congress, they rejected this plan and Mahatma Gandhi, he officially launched the Quit India campaign in 1952, the 1942, sorry. This also resulted in widespread civil disobedience because uh, people suddenly became very nationalistic and they wanted to, you know, they, they all started demanding, um, uh, you know, uh, independence, basically. Many leaders were arrested, including Gandhi. There were lots of riots and British leaders realized that India's future as, a, as an obedient colony was doomed, right? The Indian National uh, Congress, they fell out with the Muslim League. They fell out how India should be governed post-independence. And, um, you know, they, they didn't trust each other. Uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah feared that a united India as proposed by the Indian National Congress would give the Hindus more control and uh, the Muslim minority would not be treated well. So he de demanded autonomy uh, through the creation of a Muslim nation called Pakistan. This is, this is how this drama then began to escalate to the point where the British became very worried. And so enter uh, Lord Mountain, Mountbatten of Burma. He was sent by King George VI to India in March, 1947 to manage Britain's retreat from India. He was, of course, a very diplomatic gentleman. He convinced the Indian leaders to agree to the creation of two new, new states, the Hindu majority India and the Muslim minority Pakistan. He was actually given a year to complete this task, but he came under a lot of pressure because he, he, he saw at first hand how high the tensions were in India. So he decided that uh, he's going to complete this task quicker and rush the whole schedule. He uh, appointed Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who was a British barrister who had never set foot in India. He gave him just five weeks to divide the country in two and demarcate the new nation's borders. Now you may ask yourselves, why was Sir Cyril Radcliffe chosen? The reason he was chosen was because he had virtually no knowledge of the Indian subcontinent. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, perceived that he would he, he was somebody who would make an unbiased, unbiased decision, decision. So he arrived in India. He was given two Muslim um, lawyers and two Hindu lawyers to assist him with this task. He entered a hotbed of tensions, you know, a um, lot of riots and everything. And he was virtually uh, housebound in the lovely, you know, colonial house that he was given. And he, neither, he, he could never set foot out of it. Uh, he feared that he was going to be the, they feared that he would be assassinated. So he was in, under constant vigil. And actually this had such a huge impact on him that uh, when he actually left India after doing his task, he did complete his task. It took him seven weeks, not five. But when he actually departed from India, he was so saddened to hear about the death of the millions that took place across the subcontinent that he refused to take any payment for his, for his work at all. Um, but, but just to stay with the, the Cyril uh, Radcliffe at the moment, uh, he and his team, they both completed the task that was given to them. None of them, nobody in his team had any expertise in map making. They had no understanding of Indian politics or culture. And they split the two provinces of Punjab and Bengal into two. This meant, this meant that, the new, that the new Pakistan would not be a contiguous nation. You know, this landmass lay 
thousands of miles away from from the other. So West Pakistan and East Pakistan virtually laid at two far corners of India. And this decision, this, this whole decision to mark, demarcate these two nations um, was fateful. It just prompted millions of Hindus and Muslims who were stranded in the wrong new nation to then start moving across hundreds of miles. Because don't forget, this is the age of, this is not the age of uh, social media or things like that where news travels fast. You know, people were uncertain, unsure, felt uh, threatened that, you know, oh, there's so many, you know, people of, of the, of or so many Hindus around us or so many Muslims around us, we must leave. There was a, the people were hysterical. So anyway, um, on 14th of August was when Pakistan was created. Huge jubilation in Pakistan that they finally get a holy Muslim state. 15th of August, 1947, India was created. Nationalist pride was, you know, at its height. You know, uh, Mr. Nehru gave a really fantastic speech, freedom, you know, uh, at midnight, uh, he gave a freedom speech and it was fine. But what happened was that, uh, you know, because this had become such big news all over the world, uh, Mount Batten uh, was actually taken aback by the, the, the violence that took place or started to unfold. He didn't actually issue the map of India and Pakistan until two days after this, after 14th and 15th of um, August. So what happened was as many as 18 million people packed up their belongings and set out to reach the right country. This was a huge movement of people uh, right across uh, you know, the northern part of India from the east to the west. And there was an unprecedented bloodbath. Um, it was few, it fueled the longstanding in, you know, uh, Hindu and Muslim tensions. And unfortunately, this was totally out of control. Britain could not do anything to quell the violence because of the sheer scale of the of what was happening. So now we come to the legacy of partition. I mean, this violence, it actually continued until 1950. So it, it didn't stop straight away. It continued until 1950. Between one and two million people had died. In 1948, major event took place. Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated by a Hindu nationalist, nationalist Nathuram Godse, who thought that the leader was too pro-Muslim. So he got shot. Uh, home to 56% of Pakistan's population was East Pakistan, which we now know as Bangladesh. They received less funding. They had less political power than the Western part of Pakistan. So they were not happy. So then we fast forward to 1971, when they decided they're going to declare their independence and form a state, which is called Bangladesh. Pakistan was not happy at this. So right, can you see they were in one part, in the Western part, they launched a military campaign in the Eastern part uh, to subdue the population. And at least 300,000 civilians were slaughtered and there was a bloody eight month war. Ba Bangladesh officially became an independent secular democracy in 1972. And uh, India intervened in this drama and sent their army in. This war is actually very close to my heart because my father, who was a major in the Indian army at that point, he was sent as part of the, uh, his regiment was sent uh, to East Pakistan to help uh, to subdue the violence. He was actually taken prisoner of war during the 1971 war and he was missing in action before he was handed over when the ceasefire happened. So this is how close this is to my heart. Um, of, of course, the legacy, the other legacy of Pakistan, which again is another topic for another day, is the Kashmir issue because both India and Pakistan lay claims to it. And uh, this is an ongoing dispute between India and Pakistan. And of course, the last 75 years, last year we, cele well, we celebrated or marked the 75th uh, anniversary of partition. Um, in the 75 years since partition, territorial disputes between India and Pakistan over Kashmir, they continue to simmer. And there have been four wars, 1947 to 48, 
1965-1971 and there was a limited war as recently as 1999 in, in uh, between India and Pakistan which happened again in, in Kashmir. There's an area in Kashmir called Kargil. There was a very bloody um, you know, a skirmish there between the two armies. Uh, two of my cousins actually who were stationed there at the time fought in this war. Both of them got killed. One of them, uh, his wife was full term pregnant. His, his son has never seen his father. And I'm proud to say that he he's he's joined the Indian Army just as a as you know as a respect mark of respect to his father. The dangerous thing about this this uh, whole region at the moment is and he, and this was even in 1999 when this happened is that both countries possess nuclear weapons. Both India and Pakistan have got nuclear weapons. Finally, you'll be glad to know, uh, <laughs> we're coming to the end of this, but we, I don't think we can talk about the partition without talking about women. Because women, as in any war, like we know now in Ukraine, um, women are always more affected um, than, than the, the men. So in this, during the partition, approximately 75,000 women were raped and abducted. I mean, these figures are not, I don't think they're, they're true. I think there's a lot more who were raped, abducted, killed by the millions really, and displaced from their homes. Many, I mean, I, I grew up listening to these stories where many women jumped into the walls, into the wells in their villages to escape this humiliation. And many of them were killed by the, the men in their own families because they wanted to, avoid them bringing dishonor to the family if they got raped. One of these women was my paternal grandmother. My, my paternal grandfather was uh, in the training academy at Lahore at that time. He was training to be a police officer uh, when this whole thing broke out. And he obviously could not come back to his family. Uh, my, my grandmother was visiting her father's family um, in um, Faisalabad district of what is now Pakistan. So he couldn't come back there to pick up his family. He was sent, he was airlifted from Lahore to India. And uh, my grandmother and my father who were visiting uh, her parents in uh, Faisalabad district had to leave their village along with the rest of their family. And, and they had to travel on foot for nine days in a huge convoy of bullock carts and families, people on foot and bullock carts. My father has actually had, uh, he, he actually had, I do think he had post-traumatic stress disorder because he was a small child, 12 years old with no understanding of what was happening. So many times he was rolled up in blankets and duvets and shoved into the, you know, on, uh, uh, into the baggage on the bullock carts when they were attacked uh, on the way uh, just to save him so that he wouldn't, you know, be harmed because they would just lynch, they would just lynch anybody, you know, who they could find on the road. So this was this happened in both both directions. The the Muslim population moving from India to Pakistan and the, the Indian population, the Hindu population moving from Pakistan to India. This was this was not an isolated story. I'm just saying it because this is the way I know it, and I've been told about this. But they finally nine days later of this very traumatic journey, they arrived in Amritsar and they were they were put in a refugee camp, and then later they were you know placed in other parts of Punjab. The other the other interesting thing is. Uh, Rohit's aunt, my husband's aunt, she actually was unfortunate because she was actually abducted and she was raped and she was rejected by her husband's family. They didn't want to know her uh, because it was like a sign of, you know, this is bringing dishonor to our family. And interestingly, she was taken, uh, she was given refuge by a Pathan family. Pathans are also Muslims, but they're mostly found in the Northwest province uh, northwest frontier province of Pakistan, which is sort of the Islamabad area and the border with Afghanistan. And she was given refuge by them. And she was helped by them to start a dry fruit business so that she could look after her family. So, I mean, this is, this is how close this is uh, to my heart uh, and to what happened in my family. And I, just to say for the last, the last thing I want to say is, I had a, I had a personal experience of this uh, in 1984. This has got nothing to do with the partition of India, but when Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated in 1984 by her own bodyguard, 
uh, Hindu and Sikh riots broke out in, in Delhi and in many other parts of India. At that time, I was a student in Delhi University. I was boarding with my uncle, my father's older brother, who was a professor and head of the political science department in Delhi University. And, and, and I could actually feel this whole thing that I had heard as a child being replayed in my mind because my uncle actually gathered us all up, my aunt, his three daughters and myself, and said, if the rioters come to the house, I've got a revolver, I'm going to shoot you all because I don't want you to be dishonored by them. I mean, this is, this is me, you know, in 1984, I, I went through this and I could so identify with what must have happened in the partition because it was, I mean, it was on a massive, massive scale, a much bigger scale than we experienced. And luckily we didn't, nothing happened to us. We were unharmed and uh, the violence stopped soon enough and we were, uh, we were safe, but, uh, this is this is the reality of partition of India, and um, uh, I, I just want to finish off by saying one more thing, that uh, this actually came to the attention. The whole partition scenario came to the attention of uh, of a famous British poet called W. H. Auden. You must have heard of him, and he actually wrote a poem about Sir Cyril Radcliffe, which I would like to read to you because this actually is is a very vivid description of what what happened. And this is from the British perspective. Um, this poem is actually titled Partition. Unbiased, unbiased at least he was when he arrived on his mission. He doesn't actually name Sir Cyril Radcliffe in this poem, but you can see the similarity. So partition. Unbiased at least he was when he arrived on his mission. Having never set his eyes on the land, he was called to partition between two peoples fanatically at odds with their different diets and incompatible gods. Time they had briefed him in London is short. It's too late for mutual reconciliation or rational debate. The only solution now lies in separation. The Viceroy thinks, as you will see from his letter, that the less you are seen in his company, the better. So, you, so we've arranged to provide you with other accommodation. We can give you four judges, to Muslim and to Hindu, to consult with but the final decision must rest with you. Shut up in a lonely mansion with police night and day patrolling the grounds to keep the assassins at, way, uh, at bay. He got down to work to the task of settling the fate of millions. The maps at his disposal were out of date and the census returns almost certainly incorrect, but there was no time to check them, no time to inspect con contested areas. The weather was frightfully hot and a bout of dysentery kept him constantly on the trot. But in seven weeks, it was done. The frontiers decided a continent for better or for worse divided. The next day he sailed for England where he could quickly forget the case as a good lawyer must. Return he would not, afraid as he told his club that he might get shot. So, um, that is my um, end, end of my talk. And I hope that you enjoyed it. And if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel to share. But uh, one, one thing I want to just say before I go, if you have the chance, please watch uh, this very famous film called Train to Pakistan. There's a lot of literature about this. Uh, recently, I, was, I have been listening to a podcast by William Darimple called The Empire. And it actually um, gives a lot of detail about how the East India Company went to Pakistan, uh, went to India. And, and of course, Rosie, this you will be of particular interest to you, I think. There's, a, there's an exhibition currently at the, at, at the Compton Verney Gallery, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which Rosie, you introduced me to, in fact. Uh, it is by a lady called Reena Kalat. She's actually an Indian um, artist who is married to a Pakistani national. And she's displaying her, uh, her uh, exhibition in the gallery until the 23rd of January. And it is exactly about borders and refugees and politics and what happened in, in, you know, in various events across the world, including the partition of India. So if you get the chance, please do go and see it. Uh -huh. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Premier.